Great. So I know that people are still trickling in, but for the sake of time, wanted to get things started. Thanks everybody for joining today's webinar <clears throat> on the SEC's proposed rule on climate risk disclosure. My name is Gabe Malik. I'm a project manager on the investor influence team here at Environmental Defense Fund. Again, want to thank you all for taking the time to sit down with us this afternoon and, and discuss this important proposed rule. In my capacity at EDF, I spearhead our private sector engagement on financial regulation, <coughs> excuse me, and support our growing work through ESG by EDF. EDF's new Investor Climate Insights Hub will be dropping a link in the chat shortly. Uh, at a high level, really working with leaders across the finance sector to drive climate action and address the energy transition and understand that financial regulation and the SEC's rule proposal plays a, a big role in that. I also want to just flag before we turn it over to our great panelists today that EDF recently released a stakeholder guide on this rule proposal and would really recommend that anybody on today's webinar who's interested in learning more about the rule and the background on it, check out that stakeholder guide, which is featured on our ESG by EDF website. Just a quick note from EDF that this is uh, really a, an, an exciting and important step in the right direction on climate risk mitigation. And that's why we're so thrilled to host today's conversation with a really remarkable group of panelists. I'll quickly introduce our speakers and then turn it over to them for their remarks. Starting with Michael Panfield, who's the lead counsel and director of climate risk strategies here at EDF. Michael leads the development and implementation of climate risk management and resilience strategies for EDF. His work focuses on federal and state projects and cases aimed at reducing climate destabilizing emissions and revealing the consequences of climate change across the US economy. Michael engages before energy and financial regulators and federal courts across the country. He attended the College of Worcester and Columbia Law School, and we're thrilled to have him today. Wendy Cromwell is the head of sustainable investment for Wellington Management setting the research agenda and strategy for the firm's sustainable investment practice. She's also a director on the board of the United Nations Supported Principles for Responsible Investment and serves on the advisory group of the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative. Wendy has an MBA from Vanderbilt University and a BBA from the University of Mississippi. She is a chartered financial analyst and we're thrilled to have her. Fitzanne Reed, is the Deputy General Counsel for Engine Number One. She oversees legal support to several lines of business at the firm and previously held various positions at the SEC, most recently serving as Senior Counsel to Commissioner Allison Lee, where she provided advice on enforcement actions, litigation, rulemaking, and digital asset related matters. Fitz attended Pace University and Washington University School of Law is pursuing an MBA at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Really thrilled to have her on too. With that, I don't want to waste time away from our great speakers. I'm going to turn it over to Michael Panfill, our first speaker, to hear his thoughts and an overview on the rule proposal. Great. Thanks so much. Gabe, thanks everybody uh, for for joining today and, and re really eager to dive in um, on what the SEC has done here and also to hear um, from the uh, distinguished co-panelists today and, and then dive into the, the Q&A section as well. So I'm going to try to be, be quick, um, cover what is a, a lengthy proposal here in, in as short a time as possible. And I think the place to begin is is on what the SEC has done, which is uh, last month issue a, a, a proposed standard um, to mandate climate risk disclosure across publicly traded companies. And, and the idea, I think, is to bring the, the financial risks associated with climate change level with other forms of financial risk. And, and, and in my mind, this proposal is long overdue because climate change is already driving significant economic harm. And, and it's hard to start 
or know where really to start because um, the, the, the number of, of reports, conclusions, studies is voluminous um, evidencing this point. Um, in the last two years alone, the US has endured over 40 high cost weather and climate disasters. And the way those are defined is each one has resulted in it, it, a, a billion dollars or more of damage, and that's individually. So, so each of those events resulting in a billion dollars of damage or more, and that's unprecedented. And and um, study across government and academia is likewise sort of reaching similar conclusion. I'll, I'll highlight one in particular by the U.S. Financial Stability Oversight Council. This is. This is the entity, this is the US governmental entity charged with identifying threats to the nation's financial stability. And, and they concluded in a recent report that climate change is an emerging threat to the financial stability of the United States. And the core point here is that climate change poses significant financial risks. And disclosure is bedrock to how our financial system works to uncover financial risk writ large, and thus bringing the risks posed by climate change level with those other forms of financial risk is core to this proposal. It helps to ensure that investors are able to understand those risks as they seek to make informed investment decisions. Now, climate risk is organized generally into two types, transition risk, think here, changes in policy or consumer interest, technological change, innovation, things like that, and physical risk. These are really changes in baseline weather conditions and, and extreme weather events. So more frequent wildfires, severe flooding. These would be examples of the physical effects of climate change as climate change amplifies and changes those baseline weather conditions and extreme weather patterns. Ultimately, they are organizational buckets, right? The overriding point is to structure an information flow to investors on how a company assesses and manages these financial risks, akin to how any other type of financial risk is disclosed drawing from, for instance, the company's business operations or financial statements, supply chain, long-term resilience. Today's landscape is not providing that information. In other words, the disclosure standards today are not resulting in sufficiently comparable, specific, or ultimately decision-useful information on climate risk. The landscape itself is made up of a couple different um, sort of data information points. Uh, in 2010, the SEC did issue guidance on climate risk. A number of voluntary standards have emerged. I, I think probably the most well known is one by the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures or TCFD. Um, these are absolutely important efforts. These are critical efforts, but they have not resulted in the disclosure framework that investors have sought. And presently, many companies do not provide sufficiently comparable, specific, and decision-useful information on climate-related risk. Studies have um, sort of indicated that to date, disclosure is often boilerplate, difficult to parse, it uses diverging methodologies, information can be nonspecific. Um, in some instances, entire sections are missing, and, and there's a reason, right, which is that to date, voluntary standards do not provide um, sufficiently uh, comparable, specific dis decision useful information. That is, they don't incent that because they are inherently voluntary. And as a result, investors often cannot rely upon those disclosures. Now, the SEC has specific and explicit authority to remedy this current landscape and to mandate disclosure standards. In particular, their specific and explicit authority among other things, is to protect investors by ensuring that publicly carried companies disclose information that investors want in order to make informed investment decisions, to ensure that information is specific, comparable, and decision useful. And that's how the proposal itself is grounded. So what does the proposal provide? A number of different things, but, but central to the proposal is a, a requirement of information about the financial impacts of physical and transition risks. There's to organizing risks that we talked about a second ago that are reasonably likely to have a relevant impact on a business or its financial statements in the short, medium, or long term, and also the expenditures to address those risks. It sets forth a number of other related disclosures across a range of topics, like for instance, um, 
whether the company is integrating assessment and management of climate related risk into its core business functions. If so, a description of those processes, um, standardization, or excuse me, standardizing disclosure on, ex on existing targets, transition plans, or scenario analysis, GHG emissions, scope one, two, and limited scope three. Central across all of this is ensuring that relevant information about the financial risks associated with climate change are provided to investors. A few additional notes about the proposal. The first is, um, as probably um, has already been explicit across that description, but it's centered upon a requirement to disclose information. It does not mandate changes in management practices. It's disclosure of information specifically. And, and secondly, it, it draws inspiration from the TCFD, that voluntary framework I mentioned a moment ago. And, and although the proposal, of course, is designed on the basis of the SEC's own analysis and effort, what this means is that there's connected tissue between what the SEC is doing and what other jurisdictions are doing. And many of these are already well ahead of the United States. Um, I think just about every one of them relies upon in some way, shape or form or draws inspiration from the TCFD. These are places like New Zealand, the UK, the EU, Japan, Canada, several others. That's of course helpful in thinking about harmonization and alignment. So what comes next? Um, the proposal itself was released um, mid-March, I think March 21st. Um, and now the SEC is taking comments on the proposal. We'll likely do so until May 20th. From there, the SEC will review and consider comments submitted to it by stakeholders. And we hope move swiftly to finalizing a climate risk disclosure standard. Um, I'm gonna pause there and pass it over back to you, Gabe, uh, and eager to have uh, the, the Q and A soon. Great, thank you so much, Michael. And as I mentioned in the chat, feel free to drop your questions into the Q and A and we're excited for a vibrant discussion later. Uh, in the meantime, I want to turn it over to Wendy to hear her perspective from a large asset management firm on this rule proposal. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Gabe. Um, as Gabe mentioned, I'm Wendy Cromwell, Vice Chair and Head of Sustainable Investment at Wellington Management. For context, Wellington is a large independent asset manager. Um, we have uh, just over 2,200 clients in more than 60 countries, and we actively manage 1.4 trillion in assets on their behalf. Um, so I thought I might spend some time talking about how we're thinking about this rule and how we've been engaged with um, climate work over the past several years. So back in 2018, we launched into a climate research partnership with an organization called Woodwell Climate Research Center. And the goal of that research collaboration was to bridge the gap between climate science and finance. And I tell this story, which is a true story, 100% true, about the first time we sat down with Phil Duffy, who is the head of Woodwell, and brilliant climate scientist and now on loan to the White House, um, we said, Phil, we'd love to understand these variables of heat, drought, wildfire, hurricanes, floods, access to water issues, sea level rise in basis points. And Phil, again, brilliant climate scientist sitting across the table at our offices in, in Boston said, what's a basis point? And I'm hoping the investors in the audience laughed at that because that's when we knew we were onto something. These two very analytical disciplines, climate science, finance, didn't speak the same language. We didn't know uh, RCP scenarios. He didn't know basis points. If we were gonna make progress, we were going to need to work together. So the initial insight for this partnership was that climate science predictions have actually been pretty accurate, far more accurate than most financial models. So for all of the investors, we know the accuracy of financial models. Climate science predictions have been far more accurate. And as investors, our, one of the core features of our role is we're supposed to be trying to predict the future and understand how that future will change and how that will impact capital markets and how that will impact the securities that we can uh, buy or sell on behalf of clients. So climate change is no different. We want to understand that future, use these climate science predictions to help us make better informed investment decisions. And in, in the case of climate change, also to help companies understand their exposure to these risks and hopefully help to build resilience in the system. 
So through the research collaboration and the science, we've learned a ton, as you can imagine. We've learned climate change isn't too far away to matter. Um, climate change is indeed happening within an investable time frame. Secondly, um, there are inalterable physical climate risk impacts in the medium term due to the long half-life of greenhouse gas emissions. So a lot of these impacts are baked into the cake over that investable time horizon. And what that means is while we need to really focus on mitigation and transition certain to, to avoid those worst outcomes over the long term, we also need to focus on adaptation and adaptation strategies in the medium, short to medium term. And then last but not least, all of the study and increased understanding of physical climate risks really got us curious about the transition and wanting to dig, dig into the nuance of the transition, where it was happening, how fast it was happening, how likely it was to accelerate or, or slow down, which companies were engaged, what did their plans look like, which weren't. Um, and when we tried to do that more nuanced, detailed work, we found the data was lacking to do that analysis. Obviously, we think this is critical information. We think that climate change will have a profound impact on society, economies, and capital markets. And we as investors need to understand that impact and companies need to have a plan for that impact. So looking for information and information regarding how issuers are responding to climate change, in our view, is critical to diligent investment management. Currently, the ability to assess these risks and impacts is limited due to the lack of a common disclosure framework. And instead, we have a patchwork of voluntary frameworks and inconsistent information. Now, that's not to say that companies haven't made progress. Five years ago, um, we were just introducing the TCFD. We were just writing our first TCFD report. We were talking to companies about this idea. And, and some companies have really leaned into this concept to understand the risks, both physical and transition, to draft a plan, to really be communicative about it. And whenever we see that in a board director or an executive team, we are really heartened by the fact that they understand that this major economic transition is happening and they have a plan for it, or they understand they need to have a plan for it. And that gives us a lot more comfort in owning that security. But in the midst of that progress, we are still not where we need to be in terms of the data. So disclosure frameworks like TCFD and SASB are voluntary, and that does lead to inconsistent disclosure and data gaps, even amongst large companies. So for example, the S&P 500, 20% of listed companies don't disclose their scope one and scope two emissions. While we recognize the need to assess climate risks in order to do a very good job for our clients, who in turn are trying to provide scholarships to students or help retirees retire or um, help a hospital run through their operating budget. They have these lofty goals and objectives. We wanna help them and do a good job. We think understanding climate risk is key to that even though we understand that, we lack the data and information we need to do so. So when we don't have that information and we don't have company reported data, we do our best to estimate it using third-party data service providers or our own estimation processes. And while that's a stopgap, it's not perfect. It's an estimate and it's an estimate by us, not an estimate by the company. And all, often those estimates rely on industry average data. So the ability to differentiate between one company and another within an industry is hindered by that approach. We'd much rather have companies do their own estimations and give us that look into their more accurate um, information. We believe institutional and retail investors alike in the market as a whole would benefit from this common disclosure framework. Um, in the way that they would be able to better address opportunities and risks associated with climate and better address whether the companies are taking advantage of or are addressing those opportunities and risks. So specifically, we support the SEC adopting a common climate risk disclosure framework that requires companies or issuers to disclose four things. Number one, their physical location data of their sites. 
And uh, just that will help us understand if that physical location is going to be implicated by some of these risks that I mentioned before, heat, drought, wildfire, et cetera. In the interest of full disclosure, we currently have interns at Wellington who are Googling addresses of company sites to help us get that information and load it into our climate exposure risk application so that we can do that analysis. Now, certainly that's not efficient. <laughs> Um, number two, standardized reporting of greenhouse gas emissions, including scope one, scope two, and materials scope three. I'll pause for a second on scope three because I, I sometimes uh, hear the debate on scope three as being centered on feasibility rather than on the decision usefulness of the information. And we know and can provide examples of companies who are disclosing scope three in a really meaningful way. So we know it's feasible. Um, but if you focus on the decision usefulness of it as investors, downstream scope three, use of products sold for us is really interesting to understand the business strategy of a company, whether they have any top line growth opportunities or whether their top line growth will be, be hindered by the transition. So really understanding that scope three data downstream is important. We also think scope three allows us to assess the rigor of the transition plan and without scope three data, um, our analysis is far less robust. Number three, standardized reporting of other data and metrics such as energy consumption and water usage. And number four, a qualitative discussion of the issuer's climate risks and of the issuer's transition and adaptation strategies. We certainly appreciate the fact that the commission has stopped and taken time to ask investors and market participants what would be useful, what type of information would be useful to make these decisions. We think the market and investors will benefit from a common disclosure framework. And we think over the long term, issuers will benefit as well because there will be a common standardized framework rather than the need to respond to a myriad of bespoke requests from potential investors. We also appreciate that the proposed rule is interoperable with emerging global standards. Um, having a globally consistent framework is going to be far easier and reduce the burden for, our, for, our, for global companies and global issuers while providing even more useful information to investors such as ourselves. In closing, climate disclosures allow for more robust analysis of climate impacts on issuers. And we think understanding and being able to assess those impacts is critical to diligent investment management. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you, Wendy. We're now gonna pivot to our last speaker, Fitz, to hear her perspective and engine number one's perspective on the proposed rule. Thanks, Fitz. Thank you, and, and Wendy is a hard act to follow, but I'll, I'll do my best here. So first, I want to say thank you to EDF, Michael, Gabe, and, and Wendy. Uh, it's really an honor to be on this panel with you all and, and to discuss this historic and long overdue moment, uh, an important moment for investors, right, uh, in, in SEC rulemaking. So I'm very excited about this, this rule proposal. Everyone at Engine Number One is, and we hope that you all are too. So as mentioned, I'm Deputy General Counsel at Engine Number One, and Engine Number One is an investment firm that is purpose-built. So we believe a company's ability to create long-term shareholder value really depends on the investments that it makes in its employees, customers, communities, and especially the environment. So I'm going to take a moment to talk a little bit about the implications of the rule itself, um, how, what it means to it, what it, how it will impact our, our ability to actively engage with companies, and then talk a little bit about how you can support the rule through the, the comment, public comment period. And just as a preview uh, to the public comment period piece, I just want to say up front that it's really, really important to submit a comment letter. Um, the comment letters are read by the staff. The staff have to consider the comment letters that come in and, and when finalizing the rule. Um, so they are read and shout out to, to the SEC staff that are reading thousands of letters on the various rule proposals that are out there. So, so your voice matters in this, right? And um, comments from everyone really, really matter uh, when finalizing this rule proposal. And we'll talk a little bit more about how you can draft an effective comment letter and the things that I've seen uh, given my um, uh, past working at the commission. So um, 
we'll start with implications first. And the rule proposal is 510 pages, <laughs> really long. And, and it's pretty daunting if you try to think about all the moving parts there. But I think if you distill this down to some of the core components of the rule, it makes it more digestible. And so I'll just talk about some of the components that I see and then um, some of the implications there within, within them. The first core component, um, the SEC is calling for companies to tell investors the climate related risks that are reasonably likely to have a material impact on the company. And that's the words from the proposal itself. And these risks can manifest itself in the short term, medium term, or long term. And disclosures in this area alone would provide just a wealth of decision useful information. Wendy used those terms, and it's critical decision useful information for in investors about what a company itself has identified as actual or potential impacts of material climate related risks. So for small uh, and active investors, for all investors really, it gives us an opportunity to identify gaps and be ask better questions, engage with companies to better understand their perspective on some of the risks that they're seeing. So for example, if you're a company in Louisiana and you're not talking about flooding or how that might impact your operation of your business, then you, you probably have an appropriately identified physical risk, right? If you're in oil and gas and you aren't talking about the risk of, of methane specific regulation, then you probably haven't identified, appropriately identified transition risk. And those are the obvious ones. And there will no doubt be examples once this rule is finalized uh, of companies kind of missing the obvious or what investors deem as obvious. And so this gives investors an opportunity to, to ask questions. Why isn't this a risk that you've identified? Um, how do you rank your risk, right, to, in terms of these um, climate-related risks to your, to your company? And there may be a, a reason for it, right? Companies might say, you know, we missed this risk or we did identify the risk, but it, it's not material to our business and, here, and here's why. So it's the ability to be more informed as an investor, to ask better questions um, as an investor and, and to really help in decision-making around things like voting. The second core component um, is something that I think about is um, the SEC is saying, you know, tell us companies must disclose their goals and most importantly, how they plan to get there, right? So the how they plan to get there piece is cr critical <laughs> because there are some, some companies that disclose their goals, but, but don't really lay out what the plan is. So at engine number one, um, we have a data science team that goes out and, and tries to capture information on, on companies' GHG emissions reduction targets and other climate-related commitments. It's all in an effort so that you know, our team can track uh, how companies are doing, are they meeting their commitments, how far off are they? And, and as Wendy mentioned, like, you know, having interns Google, uh, it's a painful process. I mean, there's no standardized data here. Some company, many companies do things differently. Some are reporting, some are not. Um, from year to year, companies might be changing how they're reporting. So for us and many investors like us, it, it will make it allow us to be more efficient in filling the gaps um, that are currently exist in the data that's out there. Um, some of the data and information that will, will also be critical include information on how companies are considering shifts in things like customer or counterparty preferences or technologies in their transition planning. These are the things that we want to know. These are the things that we're looking for in engine number one, and I know that other investors are looking for too. Um, the third core component, and this is the, the big box office ticket item, everything, this is the one that everyone wanted to see was uh, the disclosures pertaining to, to scopes one, two, and three, and what will be required there. Um, you know, we think uh, the commission struck the right balance when it comes to scope one, two, and three reporting. There's a recognition throughout the rule proposal itself that scope three is different and has um, specific issues as, as, as opposed to scopes one and two, but still requiring companies to report it because it's decision useful information. Um, and, and again, that word decision, that phrase decision useful, you know, even, you know, engine, engine number one, our data science team looks at scope three data and because it can be helpful and useful when analyzing a company's potential for growth and, and, and you know, identifying areas for engagement. So how can you support the rule? Um, like I said, the comment letter process is really important to get to get a comment letter in. Comments are due May 20th or 30 days after it's published in the Federal Registrar, whichever is later. Like uh, uh, the comments are read, and sometimes I know it can feel, you know, maybe daunting to to have to write a letter. 
I've seen really well-written comment letters that are five, 10 pages long. Um, and if you don't want to do a letter on your own, you can you can join. There are resources for this, and it will help you in the letter writing process. And also, you can join and sign on to letters of others um, where you agree. Um, when drafting a letter, there are a couple things or four things I just want to bring up um, that I think might be helpful. So first, I would frame your comments within the context of the SEC's tripartite mission. So protecting investors, capital formation, and maintaining fair and orderly markets. When you look at the comments from the chair and the commissioners uh, around the rule, they go through great pains to, to connect each component of the proposal back to the SEC's mission. So when you frame your comments through that lens, I find it really effective and it's really helpful to the commission uh, when you do that. If you're feeling comfortable doing so, I'd also talk about the rule proposal within the context of what's happening on a global scale. So yes, it's the SEC and we're talking about US capital markets, but the rule and the work that the commission is doing is not being done in a vacuum, right? So talk about ISSB and, and how the US is lagging compared to where some other country, countries might be on this issue with respect to the climate and capital markets and how this rules is a step forward uh, for, for, the, for the US. The second part is start the letter off with what you think the commission got right. I've seen so many letters where it, even when people agree, they jump to right to how to refine the rule and improve the rule. Spend some time talking about what the, the commission got right. That is useful information for the commission so that, that they know that they're on the right track. There will no doubt be you know, many comments that disagree with the rule. It, it's, it's important to have a record that this rule is being supported by industry, by investors across the board. So um, you know, when you're thinking about where the commission got things right, think about and talk about what information is good for you, you to have. Um, how will this information improve your decision making as an investor? What data or disclosure is important to you and why? The why piece is important. Can you, can you make a cost benefit argument in support of more climate related disclosure? The cost benefit analysis is really important for the commission. It's something that they have to consider when rulemaking. And in fact, the proposal itself contains some estimated cost that companies might incur in order to comply with this rule once it's finalized. So take a minute and, and, and look at that and maybe want to comment on that, whether you, um, is, is it overestimating, is it underestimating, um, you can submit some comments and thoughts on that and that would be really helpful. You know, one thing that I think about uh, when you're thinking, when I'm thinking about this cost argument is that it's not cost effective right now for investors to try to gather information on companies given this patchwork of, of uh, disclosure. It's not cost effective right now for companies who want to report, to report and are spinning their wheels on what to report and how to do it. Uh, so by having the information in one place and a set of rules around disclosures, it really makes it more cost effective for everyone. Um, the third piece, after you tackle kind of what's working in each section and you talk a little bit about, you connect everything to the SEC's mission, um, you know, in the areas that you're most concerned with or that really impact you, you don't have to respond to everything in the, in, in the rule proposal, but in the areas that impact you and that you want to talk about, there are particular questions that the commission asks. And they, they put those questions in the rule proposal, you know, not for fun or just to see what people think. It's really because they're grappling with something and they want to know what the, the, the public thinks about these really tough questions. So spend time directly answering those questions. Um, when, you know, for us at, at engine number one, we're looking at some of the scope three related items and looking at some of the specific questions in those areas. So when it comes to scope three, uh, the commission specifically asked whether there is enough guidance in the proposal on how companies should undertake their scope three analysis. You know, we want to answer that, whether companies should be required to provide the basis for any determination that scope three emissions are not material. So there's a lot of materiality discussion that happens within, um, within the proposal. We want to, you know, weigh in on that. There, there's a question in there about whether scope three should require verification or assurance when it's reported by companies. Again, you know, we wanna be part of that conversation. Um, you know, these questions are really, really critical. And for us, it's about uh, not only receiving the data, but making sure that the data is reliable. And my, my last point, speaking of data, is some of the best comments, let, comment letters that I, I've seen and the ones that are really, really effective 
um, really lean heavily on data. Um, so it's one thing to talk about you know, what you like about the rule, what you don't like or what you'd refine. That's one level. The next level down is talking about why. The commission wants to know why, right? To answer to those questions. Why are you, why do you feel the way that you do? How, how does it really impact you as an investor? And then the most effective letters that I've seen um, really dig into the data. They support their positions with data. And so, you know, those are kind of the core elements, I think, that make really, really good, make for really, really good and effective comment letters um, and really can help sh drive and shape the conversation as the, the rule is, as the rule proposal is finalized. So I know we have questions in the chat, so I'll stop there and pass the, the mic back to, to Gabe. Uh, and thank you all again for having me. Thank you so much, Fitz. Incredible to hear your perspective, both from the SEC side and now the investor side. We're now going to open it up to the Q&A. So I'll invite Michael, Wendy, and Fitz back on screen for a more interactive discussion. I want to start taking a step back. There's a ton of just incredible information across your three presentations, but maybe taking a step back and, and Michael, getting your thoughts on how this rule proposal aligns with past disclosure requirements from the SEC and how it, it fits into the SEC's statutory mandate. Uh, thanks, Gabe. And, and it, in a lot of ways, I think we heard this answered from um, remarks of the co-panelists here in particular. I point to things both Wendy and Fitz mentioned about the decision usefulness of information here, right? So, so it is explicit, it is specific under the SEC's mission and mandate and statutory authority, right? To, to ensure that investors have access to decision useful information in evaluating risk. And that's what this rule does. So I see this as very consistent with the, the specific mandate mission in charge of the SEC. Great, thank you, Michael. Building on that idea of decision usefulness, Wendy and, and Fitz, curious to hear a few more examples from, from you all on some gaps in existing disclosures. I, I found your anecdote, Wendy, about the, the Google searching really compelling. Are there other instances that you can point to where it's just a bit difficult or unwieldy right now to get the information that you need. Sure, I mean, yeah, the Google searching is is funny, which is why I bring it up because uh, it, actually these interns are great. They feel, you know, they're very power. They understand what they're doing and why they're doing it and, and why we need the information. But they literally are like searching Google for addresses. Um, uh, so that's definitely a gap. The other thing, you know, that I mentioned before is um, our scope, the scope disclosures still aren't complete. Um, and uh, that can be tricky. One, you know, one thing I like to share with companies is investors are going to use the data, whether you provide it or whether it's estimated. Um, and that's definitely the case. And so, and that includes scope three data. Um, so if I were a company, I would rather provide that data myself um, than have, you know, an investor or another data provider estimated on my behalf. And in certain cases, so we, we buy data from two, to, we buy lots of data on this particular issue. We buy data from two different service providers. They, the estimations don't match. And so we try to triangulate and figure out, you know, what we think is right. And then in the case where we have overlap with company disclosed data, we do a comparison. So that helps us kind of calibrate better. But we find that the estimations, you know, sometimes they're over the company reported data. And so a company, and that's probably why they're reporting it, the company um, isn't getting credit if we're only using estimation um, for, for the work that they're doing or the potential, uh, 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 the potential for them to capitalize on um, uh, a change in, thinking around transition risk or low carbon transition or opposite, uh, you know, avoid a risk. Um, so that would be another example of, of lacking information. Yeah, and I, I, what said, I like about, oh, sorry, I had one more thought for Dan, I'm sorry. Um, what I like about the, um, 
the uh, proposed rule is that it puts this information um, right in the financial statements and it makes it um, clear that climate risk is financial risk, which I think is, is true. And so um, I think you know, analysts are very spreadsheet oriented, companies are often very spreadsheet or oriented, what gets measured gets managed. And so having that evidence that it's being measured, at, I think will enhance companies ability to risk manage against climate as well. So I think it's just productive all around. It helps us assess, it helps them risk manage um, and, and create higher quality earnings into the future. Wendy, I just wanted to, to second everything you said. I mean, it's just so true for us too. I mean, our data science team spends so much time trying to figure out and fill gaps, you know, in, in the data and information. And, you know, we use that information when we're going to companies and engaging with them. And when we think we have solutions that can help them, but in order for us to get to that point, they spend a lot of time Googling, trying to find data sources that don't match up, right? And so then we have to end up making the, the estimations and we much rather get that information from the company. I mean, you think how fast we could move the idea of how fast we could move if we could just capture that information from you know a 10k and quickly make an assessment and then be able to to start engaging with companies around particular issues i mean we would just be moving at lightning speed and just help so much as an investor as we try to think about um uh, things like esg and impacts and sustainability i mean we, we'd be just i mean this information is just so critical for us and would make it so much easier for us to to make uh these investment decisions and decisions around engagement so i second everything that that Wendy has said yeah and you both just mentioned in your remarks there that it actually might be in the best interest of a company. You're going to be finding this information anyway. Wouldn't it be of interest for the company to provide that information to you all directly? I'm wondering if you can expand a bit more on that. And Wendy, you mentioned in your remarks previously that in the long term, this could actually streamline the reporting practices for companies in, in your engagements with Firms have have you heard complaints, frustrations about their own juggling act as they respond to voluntary frameworks? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that you hear often from companies, from issuers, is what's important. They ask the question, "What's important?" Every investor I meet with is asking for me for different information in a different uh, format or framework. I wish there was just one way in like consolidation around this. And so now we have that. We have consolidation, or I think we have it. You know, I agree with this proposal. Um, consolidation around, you know, we think this is what is important. Show this. Um, I think that's going to allow companies um, to spend less time um, responding to all of these bespoke requests, which I know they get a lot of, we hear that. Um, and uh, just build a team or build a, you know, a person or a function, an enterprise function that can just report this information and deal with it in the same way that they deal with all of the other reporting requirements that they have around financial reporting. Um, you know, one thing that I think uh, companies are really good at is reporting their financial statements. Um, and that process, um, this, this could follow that exact same process. Sometimes people say, well, there's estimation in say scope three, but there's also estimation in traditional financial reporting as well. So there's fair value estimates, there's estimates of complex derivatives, there's estimates of accounts receivable. Um, companies do know how to do that. It's just applying that same skill set to a different area and making that more business as usual. We're, we're also getting a lot of great questions in the chat. One that I wanted to turn to, which came up in all three of your remarks, was this idea of international alignment. So Michael, starting with you, curious to hear your perspective on the importance of international alignment for the health of financial markets. And then Wendy and Fitz can turn to you both to hear about how important it might be to remain competitive compared to investors globally. Gabe, okay, well, I'll just say a, a few thousand, turn it over. You know, one certainly is um, that we've seen standards emerge in various states across a number of different jurisdictions, right? And, and, and you know, it's, it's a, a non-exhaustive list, including the EU and the UK and 
I think Canada, Japan, New Zealand, I think already has mandated uh, climate risk disclosures. And across each and every one of those, you know, in, to varying degrees, I think the TCFD indeed has been a source of inspiration. Um, similarly, I think that's the case here with this proposal, although of course it is a source of inspiration. The SEC has done its own analysis, its own, its own homework, its own, its own review to craft this proposal. But there's benefit, right, to having some of that inspiration drawn across each jurisdiction um, in the sense that these, these are publicly traded companies, many you know, are multinational corporate actors. And, and so that just makes the, the ability to comply. It's, it's very similar to the answer that was just shared, right? That there is more harmonization, that there is more comparability, there's more specificity possible when that occurs. And so I see that as a really, a really valuable component here across each one of those jurisdictions. Yeah, nothing. The SEC is not doing this in a silo, right? Like so, in the context of this is this really matters. And um, you know, if you if you take a look at the proposal itself, largely based on uh, TCFD, and 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 so is the ISS. What came out of ISSB just ten days later. And so, uh, you know, talking about that's why I want to say in the, in the comments, uh, in the um, public comments, talking about the. Um, the international aspect of this is, is critical, you know, and acknowledging that that although um, the, SC, the public markets um, in the United States is like 40% of, of all markets across the world, it's there's so much happening internationally and, and by the US lagging in this area, it does have impacts uh, internationally. And so, um, you know, this is a huge step forward in, in the US catching up <laughs> and, and that should be recognized. Um, and I, th I think that should be acknowledged. There are a couple of questions that I'll, I'll bundle together and, and turn to you, Fitz. Uh, we have a question in the chat on some examples of ways that investors might use data effectively in their comments and would welcome your thoughts there. And to address another question quickly on, on whether or not EDF or engine number one will be providing sample comments. EDF will not, I can't speak for Fitz, but I would encourage attendees to check out series's landing page. Series has a great set of resources for people looking to submit comments. And they also have their own webinar on the rule coming up on the 12th and would encourage everybody on this call to check out their presentation. But Fitz would love to hear your perspective on, on how data can be used effectively in some of these comments. Yeah, and, and also to answer that last question, uh, we plan on issuing a comment letter ourselves. I hadn't thought about or we hadn't thought about um, any sample comments, but that's certainly something we can take back. Um, so uh, use of data. So I, I think that, first of all, you don't have to recreate the, the wheel. Uh, there are our data sources. So if you look at comment letters from past, it's very common to, to cite to data that already exists. So you don't have to uh, use proprietary data necessarily. But I think in, in general, when you're talking about, let's, let's focus on scope three, there's a lot of uh, research that has been done by academics in this area already, right? So you can cite to the work of academics that you agree with, you agree with their analysis and data and, and, set, and setting the baseline on what should be reported or how scope three should be calculated. Um, there's a lot of research done in that area. You can cite to that. You can use statistics from that. Um, or if you have your own kind of analysis in-house that you've done and you feel comfortable uh, talking about that and disclosing that, um, you know, talk about that. Attach those as, as um, attachments or, um, or cite to them as in your footnotes um, uh, on your, your comments to the commission. Those are the types of things that the commission really look, look to because you know, when the commission is asking about, you know, what do you think should be the baseline reporting? Um, it's not enough to just say your thoughts. They want to, they want to be able to like look at those footnotes and dig in themselves. And that's what the staff is doing. They're looking at your sources and digging in themselves as they, they continue to refine and finalize the rule. So scope three seems to be the natural place where data will be <laughs> the most important here, but there might be other parts of the rule proposal as well, where you can kind of work in some de data or citations that might be helpful to the commission and the staff as they refine the rule. Great. You know, I, I'll offer, yeah, I'll offer a couple of other things. Um, not that our letter is the end all be all, it's not, but it might serve for some inspiration or, you know, ideas of how to use data. 
we wrote a letter that was 10 pages, so it's not you know crazy long or anything, um, to Commissioner Lee when she was um, acting uh, uh, chair. And I don't know if it's if you read our letter, <laughs> maybe you were still in the office. I did. I did. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So so we, you know we have some examples of data in there if you want to take a look at it just for inspiration. Not that I think it's you know everyone can have their own data, but we tried to do that. I think we'll probably enhance our efforts this time. The other thing in terms of commenting, and I was looking to see if I could grab the um, the email, the PRI is also, if you're a member of the PRI, they're also um, uh, providing some data and support and information and templates that might help you get started. Um, and I think that you can get those um, from policy at unpri.org um, or on the collaboration platform or unpri.org and then forward slash SEC disclosure. So there are some, um, you know, series definitely, IIGCC if you're in Europe, but it's probably, you know, probably more US focused. And then the PRI, um, people are trying to help. That's great, thanks, Wendy. We also had a question in the chat on whether Wellington could either share their letter in the chat or, or share it after the fact, and we can include that in a follow-up email if that, that works for you, Wendy. We can. This is the letter for, to the original RFI request yeah, for information, yeah. not our response letter. But That's again, right. it, we will enhance it, and we might make some changes. We might. <laughs> so. <laughs> and of I would course. just, I would just make a plug that all um, comment letters are made public, and so you can um, definitely go into the SEC website. And uh, I think the comments to the 2010 request that that Wendy is referring to uh, when. Um, uh, Commissioner Lee was the, then acting chair. Uh, all of those letters are, are public, so you can see how, what other folks have done in the past and, and kind of calibrate what might work for you in a comment letter. That's great. And I'll lastly add that the stakeholder guide that Jenny linked to in the chat earlier has a section at the end that connects readers to that comment. Uh, window for the SEC, as as Michael Michael will also uh, you know be able to to share. I want to turn to a, a few other questions as as we're winding down on time that touch on some specific decision useful disclosures that came up in your presentations. Uh, maybe starting with Wendy and Fitz, your your comments on scope three. You mentioned the debate around those, but both emphasize that it truly is decision useful for your respective firms. Wondering if you can add a bit more information or, or color on the ways that information is integrated into your investment decisions. Maybe fits if we- I, Yeah, I can, I can go first. So, um, you know, when, we're, when our data science team is, is looking at this information, they want to look at it holistically. So they're looking at scopes one, two, and three in, in order to determine where the gaps exist um, for some of these companies. And then also that then informs our decision on, on how we want to engage with companies. And so um, that, you know, it's a holistic view that we're trying to take here. And when there's so many missing pieces of information on in scope three, where we kind of have to, guess or fill in the blanks ourselves, um, you know, it, it makes it makes it much harder for us to then take that information and make informed decisions about where we want to focus in terms of an engagement piece. And so that's kind of how we use um, scope three. But like I said, it, it, it's 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 a three together. It's scope one, two and three together that we're, we're looking at in order to make a determination on engagement and where to focus and also how to track how companies are doing over time. It makes it really difficult to do that when reporting um, when companies themselves might be reporting differently year to year. Right. Um, how do we how, do, how can we track how companies are doing if we can't even rely on the data that that exists? Yeah, I'll offer that um, that letter, and I'm sure others, um, other letters as well that that we've been referring to does have some information on this. And we actually do a comparison of upstream and downstream scopes as reported by one company versus another in the same industry, and how you know it can lead to different decision making. So hopefully that will be helpful. But just baseline, if you're just you know simplistically thinking about scope three, and and maybe you're thinking more about the opportunity side of things. If you think about two automakers understanding their um, use of products sold 
and the proportion that is in low carbon intensity vehicles and the proportion that's in higher, it, it, as an investor, that's something that's really interesting. That's the trajectory of their business. That's what their top line growth might look like. Um, and so that can be um, really impactful in terms of uh, creating an estimate for that company and its long-term value. Great. And Michael, you mentioned and emphasized in your opening remarks the additional importance of physical risk disclosure. Could you add a bit more detail there on, on the ways you're seeing physical climate risks already impact financial markets? Thanks, Gabe. Um, I'll just mention a couple of quick thoughts here, but we just again point to the fact that this is sort of an organizational framework, right, where we think about transition risk and, and financial risk. The sort of animating question is, is this relevant information, is this decision useful to investors? And I, I certainly would say um, sort of both prongs of that organizing principle are absolutely relevant and, and, and important to, to ensure is, is disclosed in a way that provides specific and comparable and ultimately decision useful information. And, and with physical risks right here, we typically think about that in sort of the language of, of shifting and changing baseline weather conditions, right? changes in temperature, uh, changing in flood patterns, um, as well as changes across extreme weather events. So more, more intense, more frequent, more severe extreme weather. And importantly, across both of the baseline and the extreme weather conditions, um, we are seeing with a degree of foresight and specificity an understanding of how those physical risks will manifest. And we can say with a degree of precision, really actually down to very often like the weather station, how those physical risks will manifest. And of course, those have real financial risk. They have real economic harm. Like I mentioned in sort of the beginning of the remarks, there are over 40 you know, high cost weather and climate events from just the past two years alone. And so it is both, yes, predicted to increase, but it is also here today. And so ensuring the disclosure of those financial risks, of those physical risks, is absolutely critical to informed decision making. Great. And we're coming up on time, and this has been a fantastic discussion. Thank you to everybody who engaged via the Q&A and, and will continue to engage through the comment period and through outreach to any of our three organizations. We're really appreciative of your time. Just wanna close by offering the panelists, maybe in, in reverse order, um, an opportunity to share concluding thoughts. And Fitz, we can, we can turn to you. Well, write, write a comment letter. It's really, your voice is really important. Um, support for this is really important. Um, and, and use data, uh, loop it back to the mission of the SEC and that'll be a great comment letter. It doesn't have to be long. You don't have to do it alone. There are a lot of resources out here, a lot of examples that you can use. Um, you can reach out to, to me, engine number one. I'm always happy to have more discussions with folks around this. It's really important. Totally agree. Please, please, uh, you know, send in a letter. Um, I wanted to end with a quote that that um, is from Janet Yellen. So Secretary Yellen, she said, "This carbon transition is the most dramatic, predictable economic shift in human history." So, as investors, we want to understand it. As companies, you should have a plan for it. That's what this is about. Is is the most dramatic, predictable economic shift in human history. Um, I'm, I'm glad to go at the end because I think those were both critical points and would just amplify each one of them. You know, I think has been expressed a number of times here, climate risk is financial risk and understanding that risk is absolutely important to making um, um, you know, prudent decisions. So we just elevate that in particular. Great, thank you all. And thanks to everybody who tuned in. We're looking forward to this productive and important comment period.